Good evening. Thank you for joining us for the 2023 immuni annual immunisation update. My name is Phoebe James and I'm a professional development officer for the Hunter New England Central Coast PHN. This session is facilitated by the Hunter New England Central Coast PHN and delivered to you by the Hunter New England LHD Public Health Unit. Before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands we are all meeting on today. Here in Awabakal country, it is very rainy um, and pay my respects to presence, to elders past, present and emerging. This will be recorded and available in our education library by the end of next week. Uh, we'll be using Slido for our polls and Q&A. That will be found on the right hand side of your screen. Um, there will be some interactive polls um, for slides during their present, our presenters' presentations. Um, so keep an eye out um, and your Q&A, just send them through. We've got a team working in the background trying to madly answer all of them. Um, and there will be a Q&A session right at the end. Um, there's, uh, there's will also be an evaluation, also done through Slido. Um, if you re require a certificate for this session, this evaluation needs to be done. Due to the large amount of content that we have this evening, we will be having a 10 minute break and that will be at 7.25. Now I introduce the team. Um, we are lucky enough to have Patrick Cashman, he as an immunisation coordinator for the Hunter New England LHD Public Health Unit. With him, he has brought his trusty team of Jodie Stevenson, a clinical nurse consultant, Sharon Saxby, a clinical nurse consultant, Rebecca Johnson, also a clinical nurse consultant. And in the background, we have Kirsty Waller, who will be answering questions on Slido. Patrick, over to you. Thanks, Phoebe. G'day, everyone. Good to be with you again. And thank you very much for joining in for this immunisation update. Um, it'll run for about two hours. And thanks to my team who've prepared some great talks for you tonight. And thanks for, to Todd for doing the sound. And thanks to the Phoebe and the PHN for, for bunging this on. Um, so the program is, is up there. Uh, it'll be me, then Jody, Sharon, and Rebecca. Uh, and, and then Jody and Rebecca come back a second time and then I'll also come back a second time. Uh, so very warm welcome to um, nurse immunisers, GPs, pharmacists and any other practice staff who are joining us tonight. Uh, so for nurse immunisers you need to show that you've done some education during the year and this will suffice for that if you make it through to the end but I encourage you to make it through to the end because it's going to be a great program and um, uh, got some great things happening at the end of the program as well as at the beginning. So vaccinate for fun. So this is what happened during the pandemic. Things closed down. No footy, no festivals, no fun. And that's what life is like without vaccines. No fun. We want to open things up. We want to vaccinate everybody so the diseases are isolated and not us. So, and that, in Australia, we did pretty well because we got a lot of the population vaccinated before the COVID virus really, really got amongst the community. This is Natalie Allen. Um, she, she runs our immuno, uh, Aboriginal Immunisation Program. And Jody's going to talk about immunisation rates later on. And if you're working with Aboriginal community, I really get, encourage you to get in touch with Natalie. You can see this wonderful artwork on the right. And it's the immunisation schedule, but it's in circular form. So we think about things as linear in the Western um, uh, philosophical way, but this is a circular form, two months, four months, six months, right through to teenagers and adults and elders. Very important that we vaccinate elders. So if you're working with Aboriginal people, Aboriginal immunisations, I really encourage you to get in touch with Natalie. The Hunter New England hubs are going to close at the end of the month, which is next week. So that, the Taree hub run by Desley, the Newcastle hub run by Andrew, um, so they were down at Belmont, now they're at Wall's End, uh, but that will close. So the COVID vaccines will fall back on general practice 
um, and pharmacies and other community organisations. So thank you very much for, for picking up that slack. So the, um, we'll talk about epidemics and pandemics and vaccines to prevent them. This is a picture, you might recognise it if you're into the sort of the classics. This is Sal Salisbury Cathedral in England. And these are elm trees on the left. And this is 100 years ago. Salisbury Cathedral, of course, made famous now because that's where um, Putin um, Novichok the, the, the scribbles. <laughs> and um, before he, he's picked on Ukraine now, of course. Um, but the elm trees, you'll see it in the classical English and European pictures. They don't exist anymore. They don't exist anymore. You can't go to Salisbury. You can go to Salisbury Cathedral and see Cathedral, but you can't see the elm trees because of Dutch elm disease. It's a fungus. It went through the continent. It got into England between the wars. Um, that's not the Ukraine war. That's between the First World War and the Second World War. Um, but then re late 60s and early 70s, it really got um, a foothold and killed all the elm trees. They used to be like 45 feet high all over the place, classic English countryside, no more. So infections infect lots of different things, not just people. And so we've got to keep an eye out for infections. Be aware, there's a new um, varroa mite. Uh, Australia was the only place that was uh, varroa free. As you can see there from the map, Newcastle's the epicentre, or just north of Newcastle's the epicentre. And that mite has been now been discovered in more um, hives around. So uh, there's a little mite in the uh, bottom um, middle there, and you can see it on a bee in the, in the bottom top. So what we're really thinking about is that infections are coming, they come without notice, they come all the time. So this is a recent one, and of course we had COVID recently, but there's been two more epidemics since COVID, but happily they're both vaccine preventable. Japanese encephalitis, uh, it's been a big issue in Asia for about 150 years. Um, we had a little infections in the Torres Strait for some time, uh, but now it's in Western New South Wales. With the change in the weather, it's in Western New South Wales just for 12 months, just in January last year. Happily, it's vaccine preventable. So that's very different for COVID because COVID started and we had to shut everything down while we built vaccines. Japanese encephalitis, happily we've got the vaccine ready to go. Now, we weren't expecting a new outbreak, so the vaccine's in short supply. Um, uh, but So the, the New South Wales is providing it free. If you work outside in Western New South Wales or if you um, work with mosquitoes um, or other risk factors, uh, then that va vaccine's free. Now, when the floods were on late last year, we couldn't get this vaccine out to Western New South Wales quickly enough. Um, but now the floods have receded, people think it's not such an issue. So obviously protection from mosquitoes is really important, but this is vaccine preventable. Uh, there's a great fact sheet for um, Aboriginal mob in Western New South Wales to know the facts about Japanese encephalitis. So getting around uh, Aboriginal communities and giving this out, really, really important. Um, have it sitting around your clinic, really important information. So there's different vaccines for Japanese encephalitis. So the three graphs across the top are from Asia. Um, Japan and Korea on the left, China in the middle, and Shanghai on the right. So you can see all those graphs have got lots of disease on the left, and vaccine was introduced, and then it goes down. So this vaccine's really, really good at decreasing disease. Now the vaccine schedule from Vietnam on the, on the um, bottom right there, Japanese encephalitis is on the childhood schedule in a lot of Asian countries because that's when you need to protect little children. So if this epidemic that we've got currently in Western New South Wales, if that keeps getting worse, then we could see Japanese encephalitis eventually on the Australian schedule for small children. There's two vaccines, Jespex, an inactivated vaccine. So this vaccine you can give to pregnant women, infants over two months of age, and you can give this to immunocompromised people. And that is um, two doses, 28 days apart. But that's in short supply. Uh, there's an Imagev vaccine, which is in more supply, but that's a live vaccine, but it's a single dose. But we can't give that to immunocompromised people. Um, we, if you, you can't give it um, uh, uh, within, you can give it at the same time as other live vaccines, but if not at the same time, you need to leave a month interval. But COVID, and, and it wasn't the first pandemic that hit our shores. So in, um, 
1789, a year after the first fleet, about 70% of the local Gadigal people around Sydney were very sadly killed by smallpox because they had no immunity. So the people on the boats that came from um, England had immunity to smallpox because they'd bumped into that bug before. Uh, the Gadigal people didn't. So although there were frontier wars, and we're learning a lot about that recently, recommend Henry Reynolds' books to you. Um, but smallpox killed most of the Aboriginal people around Sydney very, very sadly. Now, this is a, now a vaccine-preventable disease. We wouldn't see this now. But funnily enough, the MPOX um, epidemic, which went around the world last year, so this is the second epidemic since COVID. It very similar to smallpox in terms of the virus. Um, and you can see the terrible effects it had. This guy, he's, he was good enough to document his um, infection with, with MPOX. Now, this is vaccine preventable. So this vaccine in Hunter, New England is available at the Newcastle um, Pacific Clinic and through the Tamworth uh, Clinic 486. And thank you very much to the staff there for providing this vaccine. So if you need this vaccine, uh, please do. And this vaccine, we promoted this widely in the last few months and got a lot of uh, people potentially at risk um, vaccinated before World Pride. Uh, so that was absolutely a huge effort. So thank you to everyone involved. Um, VaxTracker was involved in vaccine safety because this was a vaccine that wasn't used widely and we managed to get out uh, the first, world's first real-time safety data for the Genios vaccine, which is the vaccine we used for um, MPOX. Uh, now, there are two different ways of giving it. There was a vaccine sparing way because we didn't have a lot of vaccine and the subcutaneous way. So vaccine sparing is intradermal and we were able to look at the differences um, there. Uh, but COVID, so COVID was terrible. We've had it the last few years. You've heard so much about COVID, you probably don't want to hear any more. But remember in the early days, in the early days, people were choosing not to get vaccinated. So this is a headline from Texas in America. 9,000 COVID deaths in Texas, all but 43 were in unvaccinated people. So the vaccine saved lives. Vaccine saved enormous lives. So our jobs as vaccinators is to have chats with people and to get them to have life-saving vaccine. It's one thing to have the vaccine. It's another thing for have really good conversations and let people know that it's uh, that it, um, the risks and benefits of having the vaccine. So good information is really important. So two epidemics, vaccine preventable since COVID, Japanese encephalitis and MPOX, had the vaccines, got it out to the people at risk. That's what it's all about, having the vaccines before the bugs come. COVID, the bug came, we didn't have the vaccine. So what's happening around the world? This is a slide from C Professor Karina Top from Canada, who presented at NCs earlier this week. So you can see on the right-hand side of that slide the deaths from Omicron in Canada, very, very similar to the deaths from Alpha, Alpha and Delta. So it's still killing people, still killing lots of people. In Hunter, New England, we're still seeing infection um, and it's moving around. So this is the uh, LGAs in, in Hunter, New England, and thank you to my surveillance colleagues for providing that. Uh, now, there's been... Uh, studies showing that vaccination will reduce the risk of long COVID. Um, there's a new study from the UK, about 3,000 people in each arm of the study, um, people who are vaccinated and people are unvaccinated, and then looking at long COVID, and there's about a 43% reduction, 41% decrease in long COVID in people who are vaccinated compared to unvaccinated. So again, vaccinations are not perfect, but it will decrease risk. Uh, this, again, is a slide from NCS um, earlier this week. Uh, and this is um, showing that the biggest risk for COVID, bad outcomes from COVID, death from COVID, is age. So the uh, risk uh, at 80 years of age is over 30 times a well 50-year-old man. So that's a huge risk. So um, I went to my uncle's funeral last month in Sydney. Uh, he was 82. Uh, he was um, smoked cigarettes a lot of his life. And he died of COVID um, last month. So COVID is killing people, um, but the risk is really pe older people. So people to get for that booster, especially are older people. Uh, so here you can see uh, the risk of severe disease. So the dark bar there is um, uh, older people, the lighter bar, younger people, less than 65. And you can see the first dose on the left, second dose on the right, 
and that's the benefit of the vaccine. So the benefit of the vaccine is much bigger, so the dark bar changes size to much smaller than the lighter bar, so the benefit of the vaccine is much greater for older people than, than for people less than 65. Again, Professor Karina, um, data from uh, Canada and the United States. Um, so this is saying there's lots and lots of work on vaccine safety. So people are worried about vaccine safety, but lots and lots of work on vaccine safety. So this talks about cases of myocarditis. And you can see there are millions of doses, but only small numbers of myocarditis after the mRNA vaccines. But interestingly, right in the middle of that slide, have a look at that. Administration errors, the most common form of AFI reports in America. So administration errors, so that's us. That's us. That's the people who are putting the needles in the arm. So doing it accurately, doing it right, making sure you're doing a good job, giving the right vaccine to the right person in the right location. This is critical. So you're going to decrease adverse events just by giving it properly. Make sure you're checking what vaccine you're giving. Um, so double check, especially for children. There's different vaccines for children. Um, so if for smaller children, it's a three-dose primary course. Um, so we don't think about it as a booster dose. Uh, so for children six months to five years, the only people who are recommended are people who are severely immunocompromised or who other, have other medical conditions. Uh, so it's not recommended for every child six months to five years. So this group, the risk for small children is in people, in small kids who, who have got other conditions. So this is a wonderful graphic from Atagi to simplify what I've just been talking about. So under five years, in red there, Atagi advises that a booster dose is not recommended um, if you're well. Uh, it not, not recommended at all. So here we're talking about booster doses. So no booster doses if you're under five. If you're under five, you're only having the primary course if you've got immunocompromising conditions. Five to 17, do you have severe risk factors? No, then have your primary course but no booster. Yes, you've got risk factors. Then you go to the yellow in the middle, which is the same of people 18 to 64 with no risk factors. And the word there is a target advisors you should consider the booster dose. So it's not a recommendation, it's for you to consider it. Whereas on the right-hand side, people over 65 or people 18 to 64 with risk factors, yes, Atagi recommends the booster dose. So the booster dose is recommended at least or six months since you've had disease or six months since you've had your last dose of COVID vaccine. So consideration, that one in the middle, um, that's having good conversations with people, giving good people good information and then they make up their own minds. On the right-hand side, strong recommendation from Atagi. Now, you want to be giving the right vaccine. So there are several COVID vaccines for small children, um, Pfizer, Moderna, um, different ones for different age groups. And <laughs> quite nicely, they've got different coloured tops on them to make it a bit easier to follow. Now, this is a poster. Uh, there's two pages. I'll just go to the second page. So all the COVID vaccines are nicely listed on this poster. So this should be on your wall next to your fridge um, so that you can be giving the right vaccine to the right person. Now, the response of good immunisers to this poster is not, oh, it's too hard. I'm not going to do COVID vaccines anymore. The response is to know what you're doing, have the vaccines for people who need them, who decide they want to have them or for who it's recommended for. So for those people who... A target asked to consider the vaccine. There's some great decision age on, on the NCS website for children 5 to 15 for their parents and people 16 up. And you can go through that decision aid. You get to things like this. Uh, so on the left-hand side is what the decision aid looks like. On the right-hand side, we've put in some data and it shows that on the left, the risk of disease is greater than on the right in blue, the risk of the vaccine. So in summary, um, uh, great summary here from NCS, and I've, the doctor's name who presented this wonderful information just <laughs> eludes me. Um, so the strongest evidence is that uh, for people over 65, a booster will uh, give really, really good protection. The risk of hospitalisation and, and death in people under 65 is lower unless you're approaching 65, <laughs> if you knew anyone in that category. Um, so Atagi's made the judgment call that most people under 65 will not gain significant benefit from another booster dose, which is why they ask you to consider it. And then there's the information you can present to people. 
So for people 18 to 64, without risk factors, there's small benefits but small risk. There's no right and wrong answer. But this is a good place to be. The, the disease has become more mild. It's not killing as many people. Vaccines made life as good as possible. We've got most of the population vaccinated. So people have good immunity on board and the virus is really struggling. So if you've got lots and lots of deaths, then the vaccine recommendation is much more in people 18 to 65. But we don't because we've got really good background immunity. So this, I reckon, this a target not recommending the vaccine between, for people between 18 and 65, but asking them to consider it is actually a great place to be overall for the whole country in Australia. So vaccines have made life possible. So we've taken away that sign. No festivals, no footy, no fun. So that's fantastic. But the pandemic's left a legacy for young people. So this is a fantastic, uh, an article in the MJA by Dr. Archana and Dr. Phoebe, pediatricians from NCS. And during the pandemic, 61 million children have been pushed into poverty. A billion children have fallen behind in their schooling. And that bottom one's a killer. 10 million young girls have been forced into child marriage. So the pandemic's been hugely disruptive. Um, so these are public health goals. These are things that we would have claimed victory on in the past, but the pandemic's changed all that. So this is, this is terrible. So now we've got to work harder to help people regain where they were, um, the life benefits um, they had uh, before the pandemic. And ch young people have been severely affected. Uh, so the impact of COVID on adolescent mental health has been huge, especially for females. So the bottom line there, um, impact of the pandemic has been greater in young women exposed to the pandemic and they've got more depressive symptoms. And in the middle there, we estimate that the COVID vaccine pandemic had not occurred. We would observe 6% fewer adolescents with high depressive symptoms. So older people have been really saved by the vaccine, life-saving. I'm probably only here because I've had a vaccine. Younger people, the health benefits have been less, but they've paid a huge price. So we've really got to look after young people. So for, if you're working in practice, if you're working in pharmacies, if you're working as a nurse, look after those young people because they paid a high price. They've got other health priorities. We've, we've got to help them. Uh, and globally, this is young people, mortality on the left, morbidity on the right. This is global. Uh, this is pre-pandemic. So we've got young boys, 10 to 14 on the left, more mortality, and 15 to 19 in blue on top, and then young women underneath. So for blokes, 15 to 19, uh, Injury, road injury and violence. Then TB, tuberculosis, a vaccine preventable disease is the third killer of young men all around the world, 15 to 19. And for young women, diarrheal diseases, vaccine preventable uh, in some, in some, um, some instances, uh, 10 to 14 years of age and lower respiratory tract infections, again, potentially vaccine preventable. But for young women, 15 to 19, the biggest killer of young women all around the world, 15 to 19, is TB, vaccine preventable. But again, we don't have a great vaccine for TB. We don't have a vaccine for a lot of the diseases that kill poor people because there's no money in it. So we really got to make sure we get better vaccines. The TB vaccine we, we have is about 120 years old. So that's just not good enough and it's killing young women. So we need better vaccines. If COVID's taught us anything, it's to have vaccines before the virus comes. Don't wait until something happens, we shut the whole place down. But of course, we don't shut it down for young women dying in third world countries. And morbidity, again, it's what we've seen. It's, it's, it's um, uh, psychological disorders. So all those blue ones there are non-communicable diseases and, and psychological disorders for young people. So we've got to look after young people a lot better. Now, Big Pharma have let us down. If you open your fridge, you won't see a lot of those names of those companies on COVID vaccine, with Pfizer being the exception. So Big Pharma make the profits, but they're not reinvesting it in um, R&D because we need more vaccines and better vaccines. So happily, uh, the World Health Organization, as you can see on the map there, they're now making mRNA vaccines around the world. So hopefully we can protect more people. But um, CSL, the Australian company, spend a less than a quarter of what the Moderna company uh, spends on R&D. So we've got to spend a lot more money on R&D, have better vaccines, protect more people, and then for you guys to get those vaccines out to people, whether it's Western New South Wales for JE, uh, uh, for, the, um, uh, 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 for the community, for monkeypox, and, and for people who need protection. Uh, so that's your job. 
Uh, so thank you very much for being involved and I'm going to hand over to Jody now. So I didn't give her enough warning. She's running from the back of the room. Hi, Patrick. I thought you still had a few slides to go. Did I? I, I don't know. No, 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 that's it. That means end. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We can see in the chats that um, people are struggling with internet access at the moment. We've been assured that everything's working okay for, from our end. And just a reminder, this will be um, recorded and available next week. Oh, thanks for your help, Patrick. So I'm going to have a quick chat about childhood immunisation rates. Again, as I mentioned March last year, I think it's been a massive success story for all the work that you've done out there. There's just still a little bit more work to go. Again, a massive success story though. Kerry Chant has been in touch and she asked me, I may be ad-libbing a little, but I'm sure she asked me just to thank you all personally for the amazing work that you're doing and just saying if we could keep it going but just tweak it a little bit more. So this is our data, Hunter New England coverage data for one-year-old bubbies. So this is bubbies making sure that they've had their six-month vaccine, so their two, four and six-month vaccines. Can you believe that in December 20, we had a high coverage of 96.4% for this age group? That's middle of pandemic stuff and you guys got our rates up to 96.4. Sorry, that's me touching the microphone. They dropped a little at the moment. We're down to 95.2 in our last quarterly data. So that's what I'm saying. There's still a little bit of work to do because we know we can get it back up to 96%. This time last year, we were fifth in the state. We are now third. However, there's a gap between mainstream and Aboriginal coverage of around 0.8%. So please look out for your Aboriginal children and make sure that we're getting um, all children immunised on time. Children at two years of age, again, this time last year when I presented this data, we were fifth in the state. All your hard work has got us up to third in the state at 93.4%. But picture this, June 2021, again, middle pandemic, we were sitting on 95% coverage for this group. So this is your two, four, six, 12 and 18 month vaccines, 95% coverage. We've dropped down to 93.4. This is the bit that I'm saying there's still a bit more work to do. And Again, with this group, there's a, there's a gap of around 2% coverage between mainstream children and Aboriginal children. At five years of age, we're sitting on 95.5%. So that's just your four-year-old DTP, IPV. Picture again, March 2021, mid-pandemic, we were up to 97.2% coverage for this group. So this is why Kerry's a little concerned because they're dropping. They're still good, but there's still work to do. This one's a success story. So again, we're above New South Wales and Australia average. Aboriginal children are still at 97% at this age group. So that's super exciting. So these are where our gaps are. Patrick's been sending this information out to the sector managers. So I won't dwell on this. I'll just say that strategies to improve our immunisation, what we've been doing, what you've been doing has been amazing. So personal recommendation from you, the nurse, you, the practice staff, you, the aged care worker, you, the community nurse, your personal knowledgeable recommendation regarding the safety of vaccine, the efficacy of vaccine and the need for the vaccines. Keep it going. Consider letting some families drop in because it's really hard with appointments. Please keep up your reminders, either phone calls, text messages, we're finding quite successful, or letters. Make their next vaccine appointment when parents are leaving this one. And check air for every child so you can correct the data. If the family comes to you for their six-month vaccines and you can see in the blue book that two and four months have been given, they've been signed for, they're stickers, they're legit, you can add them to the immunisation register. 
again, you may see this letter popping around. We've been sending this out to families, encouraging them to bring this letter to you, their provider. We tell them what they're missing and ask them to come and see you or to give us a call if it's in the blue book and we can add it. And my final slide is just a quick reminder about meningococcal B, the BEC0. So the funded catch-up schedule for Aboriginal children up to two years of age finishes this year for BEC0. So now's the time to have a look at all the Aboriginal children on your books to ensure that they've been given the gift of BEC0 vaccine. If not, start them now. And just a reminder with BEC0, the number of vaccines you need depends on the age that you started. So you start your schedule left, less than 12 months of age, three doses. Start your schedule after 12 months of age, it's two doses. And they're all at least two months apart. My big thanks, again, Kerry says thanks as well. Keep up the amazing work and hope you can all stay to the end and I'm hoping all the technology issues are fixed. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Sharon, who's going to catch you up on what's happening in school vaccines. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Jodie. Oh, it's lovely to see you all again this evening. Just not sure what you've done here, Jodes. There you go. All sorted. Even I can work out technology, which is a really good thing with a school program this year that I can have a little bit of a grasp on technology. <laughs> so I really hope that on this stormy night, you guys are all tucked up in your pajamas with your glass of your favourite um, beverage and enjoying our night tonight. So thanks for joining us. I'm here just to let you know what's happening with the school vaccination program. I think it's probably fair to say that um, COVID has given the school vaccination program a bit of a bashing over the last few years. But on the flip side, it's actually given us some great opportunities to um, improve our program in many ways that probably would not have happened without COVID. So before we go too much further, I'd just really like to say thank you to you all because I know that you guys have been inundated with um, students with requests for HPV, boosterix and meningococcal vaccines over the last few years when kids haven't been able to make it to school. Uh, we know that schools have been closed, kids are not turning up to school and we know that absentee rates are just um, skyrocketing since COVID. So uh, they're all popping into you. So thank you very much for supporting us and getting those rates up. So I think it'd be... Um, you all probably remember these lovely things, paper consent forms, and we all know what a drag they were for many, many years. Taking these home, expecting students to take these home, get their parents to sign them and bring them back signed so that they could have needles. It was always a bit of a dud. So we've been hoping for a very long time that we can move on from this and have online consent. And thanks to COVID, we now have online consent. If any of you have worked in the, uh, any of the COVID vaccination hubs, you'll be familiar with a system called VAM, which is an online consent process. We have taken that, we've stolen a little bit of that and created it just specifically for school vaccination. So it's really fantastic and parents can now give consent online. So you might wonder how is that all happening? All of our schools have been given lots and lots of resources as that poster is on the right. Uh, and we've asked them to distribute them to all their parents through whichever means they use and to distribute them frequently because we know that all parents need lots of reminding. And on there, there is a URL and there's also a QR code. So parents can either go on and um, use the URL on their, their device or they can scan the QR code with their phone and it will take them straight to the portal. Sorry, I'm dropping stuff everywhere here. So what happens when they click onto the portal? they will come up with this screen. Okay, this is a little bit confusing to some, but down the bottom there are actually instructions if you identify as a patient, a carer, or a parent and guardian, or a healthcare provider, and it will give you instructions about which one you need to select to get yourself to the consent portal. You may well have parents asking you uh, in your general practice, if you're in general practice, about how to give consent to the program, and this is just letting you know how to direct them. So parents, need to click on the Service New South Wales account. We are using the Service New South Wales account platform for security reasons, but also because most people already had a Service New South Wales account through COVID so that they could scan into places and they could get their um, COVID certificate. So we know that most people already have one of these accounts. 
Plus they also get their, um, their vouchers, et cetera, through this same account. Our school vaccination program staff use the staff ID link. If parents click on that, they will find nothing about school vaccination consent. So if you have a health staff member who wants to give consent for their student, they need to pretend they're just a parent and go through the Services New South Wales account. But having said that, if people hear Service New South Wales account and decide to go to their Service New South Wales app, they won't find anything about school vaccination consent. We are purely using their platform for security reasons. But we understand that we live in a very privileged society where most of us have beautiful access to the internet, except for tonight when there's storms around. But there are always some people who cannot afford, either afford to have access to the internet or wherever they live, there is just no access to the internet. So these people are going to need a paper consent form. The other people who need one are people without a Medicare number because Medicare number and details are mandatory to complete an online consent. They've brought that in because of all the cyber security attacks that were going on over the last 12 months. So it's just an extra level of security. So if they don't have a Medicare number or they can't provide their Medicare details, they cannot provide an online consent. So we will have to revert to paper consents. And same with the children who live in out of home care where the consent provider the Medicare number doesn't match that of the student. So there are just a few little things around there. So what's our program going to look like this year? So Year 7, fairly familiar with what we've been doing in the past. DTPA, single dose, HPV, Gardasil 9, and in Year 10 we give them a meningococcal ACWI single dose. But as most of you know now, we are celebrating and doing a happy dance because it is now a one dose HPV schedule. That is a huge relief to us because we have hundreds of kids from the last few years who are still due their second dose of HPV. And now we can just put those cards away and everyone is complete. So you might wonder, how did we get to a one dose schedule? So WHO back in April 2022 decided after evaluating a whole lot of emerging evidence that a single dose schedule was providing comparable efficacy to the two and three dose uh, regimes. So they concluded that a single dose delivers solid protection against HPV. That is really good news on lots of fronts. Um, one of the biggest ones is that a single dose schedule will result in more doses being available for equitable dist distribution. So this means that uh, we're gonna have, it's an expensive vaccine, we're gonna have more doses to distribute widely around the world as 95% of cervical cancer is caused by transmitted, uh, sexually transmitted HPV, but 90% of these women live in low and middle come, um, countries. And we know that just the distribution of vaccine, actually being able to um, provide the vaccine, purchase the vaccine and distribute it in some of these countries is extremely difficult. So getting one dose in is much uh, easier than getting two and three doses into them. So WHO have a, a, an aim to eliminate cervical cancer as a public health uh, issue by 2030, which requires 90% of girls to be vaccinated by the age of 15. So the really good news is Australia is well on target to reach that by 2030 and would be one of the uh, first countries in the world to do that. And that is due to this fantastic vaccination program that we have, vaccinating girls and boys, and the great screening process, cervical screening um, program that we have in Australia. So you might say, what is this emerging evidence? So Professor Julia Brotherton, who is just the absolute champion of uh, cervical cancer and prevention of cervical cancer in Australia, summed it up beautifully in an article to the ABC recently. So it's based on, the emerging evidence was based on three strong studies. Okay, there was a study in Costa Rica. It was originally designed to evaluate efficacy of three doses of bivalent vaccine and some women inadvertently received only one or two doses. So they followed those women up. And the results were there was as good protection from one dose as there is from three doses. Another larger study in India uh, was evaluating a three dose schedule of the quadrivalent HPV vaccine. So we've got two different vaccines and it was stopped partway through for other reasons and some girls had only received one dose. The results there was there was equivalent protection for those with one dose as those with two or three doses. And Kenya had a larger study again, and it was a randomised trial with some girls receiving multiple doses of HPV vaccine while others only got one dose. 
and efficacy there showed a single dose for either bivalent or nine-valent was 97.5%. So that's all rather incredible. So it's, it's good to remind you that none of these girls necessarily deliberately got just one dose. We weren't leaving some at risk and vaccinating the others with more doses. It was inadvertent um, evidence that we got. So there is some really strong evidence, and this was built over um, about 11 to 12 years. So what is Australia doing? So you all know that as of the 6th of February 2023, Australia made some sweeping changes to our HPV dosing. So we now do a single dose of HPV. So Gardasil 9, one single dose. Catch-up was also extended. So catch-up used to be to the age of 20. It is now up to and including 25 years of age. The recommendation is that anyone now who has received a single dose of HPV vaccine before the age of 26 years are now considered fully vaccinated. So no more doses required at all, unless they're immunocompromised. And that still sticks with our three doses of HPV vaccine. So this is all really good news and makes it much more doable. So who's eligible for catch up in the school program? We're still doing extended catch up. So year eight and nine, if they haven't had their vaccines yet, we will be looking for them at school and year 11 and 12 for their meningococcal vaccines as well. So the fact that we're online now, we're all using um, iPads in the school program. And that means we can look up the, the student's consent, obviously the online consent. We can record vaccination details on the iPad, which is brilliant. And one of the benefits here, or there's two benefits, really good benefits, is we have access to student air records during the clinic and the vaccination records that we um, document on our iPads are uploaded to air the day of the clinic. So it's real time and accurate records, which is a real bonus. So when the children miss um, doses at school, just be sure that our school teams are gonna make the most of every opportunity still, and we will offer catch up vaccinations at every school visit but some kids are always gonna to prefer to come and see their GP for lots of different reasons. So we just ask that if they come to you, um, I know you'll look after our children very well, but please ensure that you upload any school-based vaccines to um, air in a timely manner. At the same time, if the kid says that they haven't had them or have had them, you'll be able to check air and you'll know that ours are on there as well. So what are we hoping for? We're hoping for an increased return of consents because of online consent. We're hoping that there's a high student attendance. We know it's very difficult for some parents to get their school, kids back to school. And we want every student to be provided with an opportunity to be protected against these diseases. So thank you for all the support that you give us and keep up the great work. Hey, good evening. I swear that wasn't me that caused that issue. Um, so I'm back. You saw my picture before. So I'm going to talk for five-ish minutes about influenza and then we'll all get a nice little break. So influenza in 2023, it's back. I had a brief hiatus due to COVID-related measures with the border closures and the, the um, business. Okay, apparently you can't see my slides. That was me. Um, ah. Here you go. Lines on a graph. Anyway, so flu had a little hiatus. It's back. Um, made its return in 2022 and predictions are saying that it's likely to continue in its seasonal pattern like it um, has before we close the borders. Um, so there's lots of unknowns at the moment as to how both flu and COVID are going to behave this, this season as we lead up to winter. But the one thing that we do know is that vaccine is going to give us our best protection against severe disease and hospitalisation. 
Um, so when your patients are coming in for their flu vaccine, that's a really great opportunity to recommend a COVID booster if there's somebody who is um, able to have one at this time. And these vaccines can be co-administered or administered at any interval. So that means if they come in for their flu vaccine this week, come back the next day, come back in two weeks, come back whenever and say, hey, hey, I would like a COVID vaccine now, you can just go ahead and administer that. Um, ATAG is advising the optimal um, time to vaccinate to get good protection is around mid-April and May. And I've got these graphs from flu tracking up on the screen there just to demonstrate to you. Um, this is data that's collected from Australians that answer a survey every single week around their cough and, and um, fever symptoms. So this isn't serology data, this isn't swab data, this is just who got sick. And you can see there that those lines um, track really nicely. If you look at the dotted blue line, you can see that peak in around August, September is when the majority of people said I got sick this winter and then it goes down. Of course, if you look at the yellow line from last year, that peak was a bit early. So going back to everything's a bit unknown. But if you do get your vaccines in and around April, May, you're going to hit that peak kind of no, no matter when it falls. So what's going to be in our 2023 um, vaccine? Just I've got this beautiful picture from nature. That's your, your flu virus there up on the screen. Um, and you can see there your, oh, I don't even know if I'm going to attempt the words now, but you, <laughs> I've been practicing all afternoon. Your hemagglutinin and your numerididase, which I've circled there, they're the proteins on the outside of your flu vaccine. The H and the N is what makes up your H and your N of your influenza A viruses. It's your site that gets that mutates over time, which is what drives our need to update the vaccine. And it's your site that is um, the main target for your protective antibody. So that's your yellow around the outside of the vaccine there. The very clever people keep an eye on what's going on with those proteins to inform us as to whether we need to update the vaccine each year. So this year, we've, there's been an update to the H1N1 strain, which is hopefully gonna provide some, some good protection against influenza. So your vaccines that are going to be available, you hopefully all have this poster. Um, the main thing to remind yourself is to check your right brand for your right age. Um, just pulling out that your Fluad Quad is exclusively for your over 65 and that's your vaccine with your ad adjunct in it. Um, and your, now I'm going to fumble on my words, excellent. Um, your a fluria quad <laughs> is your one that's only for your over fives. So they're just your two practice points to really remember. Reminding you that your everybody gets a full dose. Children in their under nine in their first year have two doses with a one month interval. But if they had one last year and they, they didn't come back, that was missed. There is no catch up every year from that. They just have their single dose. You might get asked some questions about allergies. All our NIP vaccines are latex free and ASCII ad advises that your egg allergic individuals can safely be vaccinated with an influenza vaccine um, with no additional precautions that you need to take um, aside from what you would routinely do for anyone who gets a vaccine. Your eligibility has not changed, really focusing on all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over six months of age, children six months to five, pregnant women and people over 65, and then your people with your medical risk conditions, um, and that's not changed either. So your clinics are coming up. In your top picture there, we've got people lining up for vaccines. In your bottom picture there, people lining up for the Boxing Day sales. It looks the same. And sometimes I think we do feel like that leading up to the flu season, that, that our, our patients are banging down our door waiting for their flu vaccine. So stay calm. Discard any of your 2022 stock if you haven't already. Confirm your pre-allocation if you haven't already in the vaccine centre. 
And just know it takes about four weeks for distribution from start to finish. So if the practice down the road's got their vaccines and you don't, you haven't been forgotten, it's a four week window that those deliveries will occur. Um, and once you've got your vaccines in your fridge, that's when you can start booking patients and getting them in. And if we think back to that curve at the, the start, we've got plenty of time if those vaccines are arriving in the next month. And just if you want any further information, I've glossed over a lot really quick, your Health Pathways is, is your go-to resource that I'm sure everybody is accessing regularly. And that, and that is it from me. We're gonna to go to a 10 minute break. Um, so just grab a cuppa. Yep, grab a cuppa, no one's coming back and come back in 10 minutes.
Hello there. Welcome back. We had a bit of a chat here and we can picture you all in your jimmy jams, your Ugg boots, blankies, honestly, glass of wine. We wish we were at home as well. Thanks, Phoebe, for that second round of coffee. Much appreciated. I want to talk about cold chain. And I'll show you why we keep going on about cold chain. So as an immunisation provider, the last thing you want to be sitting in your clinic, um, a mum with, <laughs> I don't know if that came through the audio, some big thunders, a mum with a beautiful new six week bub sitting in front of you. And the best you can say is, look, we probably stored those vaccines okay. I think they're in the good fridge. They'll probably be fine. When we're talking about vaccine, probably is never good enough. Probably is not good. It's not good enough storage. So with Cold Chain, we're guided by the Strive for Five book. Strive for Five are our guiding principles. That's telling us that the vaccines need to be stored between two to eight degrees and we're striving for five degrees. Honestly, Goldilocks, vaccines are the Goldilocks of the medicine world. Can't get too hot, can't get too cold. They won't work, they won't be effective. They may not be harmful, but they just won't be potent. So we really need to be mindful and make sure we get Strive for Five right. Okay, so our vaccines have to be kept in our purpose-built fridge. This fridge has to be serviced every 12 months. No vaccines to be stored on the bottom shelf. No vaccines to be stored against the side walls. Remember our Goldilocks can't get too hot, too cold. They need air circulating around them. Don't overstock your fridge. You can order at least twice a month. It's going to be okay. There'll be more vaccines are coming. And if you don't have room for your flu vaccines, consider that second fridge or even that third fridge, depending on the patient load at your service. Never, never, never let your patient store their vaccine at home. Remember, we don't store any vaccines in domestic fridges or in any cars. It's purpose-built vaccine fridges only. If you've given people a script, you need to tell them, get the vaccine on the way back to the surgery, let reception know, and you'll put it straight into the fridge. And this is why we keep banging on about cold chain. A, it's essential. And B, this is what we're seeing. So this one says Boostrix, out of date, emergency use only. This is when we get it right. And this is what it looks like when we've overstuffed our fridge. Far too many vaccines for the size of it there. So we've got our purpose-built fridge that's not overpacked. We don't have vaccines on the floor. They're not touching the walls. What else have we got to have in our fridge? It's mandatory that we have a data logger, a working data logger. This data logger is set to record the temperature every five minutes. You're downloading this data logger once a week or whenever you're concerned. I reckon most people are going to be downloading it tomorrow because I think there's going to be power outages around the network tonight. As well as your data logger that's set for every five minutes and set to run continuously, you also need to have an independent battery operated min max thermometer. Not the one built into your fridge, that's a Bonza. You also need one more, a battery operated one. So that's in addition. And that's how we plot and record our current minimum and maximum temperature that's been shown on your min max temperature, gra temperature thermometer. That's how we do it. We don't just plot the current, we have to plot the minimum and the maximum. And just a reminder, we do that every night. So when we put the vaccines to bed, we've reset our thermometers, we've plotted the temperatures, and we know that our vaccines were safe overnight. When we come in in the morning, again, we check our thermometers, we check the minimum, maximum current, plot them. If all's good, no further actions, use your vaccines happily and safely. If there are any issues, download your data logger. What else do we need? So we've got our purpose-built fridge, our min-max thermometer and our data logger. We also need these stickers. There's a sticker that says, do not turn off the power. There's another one that says, stop, don't open the door till you know what you want. We need to do an ice slurry test on our min-max thermometer every year and change the battery every year. And we need to service our data logger or change the battery on our data logger every year as well. <clears throat> we also need to do our annual vaccine storage self-audit. 
This is in Strive for Five. This is, again, not optional. This is mandatory. Start your plan on when you're going to do these and then every 12 months you know where you're up to. Okay, so you've done your very best. You've got your data logger sorted. You've been recording your temperatures every day that someone's in your practice. But still, stuff happens. You've done everything you can, but the power went out. There was a storm. The door was left open because you let someone have access to your fridge. The fridge was unplugged. The lovely cleaner come in and didn't see the sticker saying, don't unplug the fridge. We've had people make a cup of tea and unplug the fridge to make a cup of tea. Or vaccines were delivered during your lunch break and they were put under the counter so no one was bothered and they've been forgotten. All cold chain breaches happen and they all need to be reported. Please don't ever ignore a suspected cold chain breach. Remember, probably stored okay is just not good enough when it comes to our vaccines. Actions need to be taken. This is a really good poster, managing cold chain breaches that can go up around your um, services. So temperature's gone out of range, that's below two or above eight. Isolate the vaccines, put a label on there saying, do not use cold chain breach. Do not discard them because that's our job at public health and then start your investigations. You, you need everyone in your service to be familiar with how to use your data logger because the day you have a breach is the day that you're off. So you need to make sure everyone else knows how to do it. So the investigations include why was the fridge out of range? How long was it out of range? What was the maximum temperature and for how long did it get up to? Your data logger has all that information on it. This is the system that's been set up. It's a great system. Again, please don't hesitate. If a, a suspected cold chain breach, let us know. We want you to be able to use your vaccines with confidence. You've done your investigation. You've worked out there was a breach. You need to fill in the cold chain breach reporting form. This is available on our website, on the Hunter New England website page or give us a call to talk about it and we'll send you out a link to the cold chain breach reporting form. Fill this bad boy in online. Please don't print it out and fill it in in pen. It makes it too hard for us to put in our information. Fill it in online, attach it to an email with your saved data logger and send it back to your public health unit. This is the process all around New South Wales. So essentially we're talking to mostly Hunter New England people, but this is the process all through New South Wales. When you're emailing your public health unit, ensure you have a signature block on your email. It's so hard when you just write, cheers, Kathy. Honestly, we don't know who you are. It's really helpful. Just put a signature block on. This is a tricky bit about if vaccines have been in a previous cold chain breach. They're the number that goes in the bracket. So in this example, with your Actib, you've got a total of 14 doses in your fridge. Five, this is their first cold chain excursion and nine already have stickers on them from a previous breach that you've reported to us. We've got all that information online. We then make decisions about what vaccines we're gonna keep, what vaccines we're gonna advise you to discard. We provide that information through to New South Wales Ministry of Health and we provide it back to you as well. We have what's called thermostability data, super useful, lets us know the best thing we can do with those vaccines. This is my take home list final slide on cold chain. Report any cold chain excursions. Don't, don't think we don't wanna know about it. Don't think you're gonna get in trouble. I promise you don't get in trouble. We're all adults, accidents happen. You just need to let us know. Vaccines are special. They need special care. Think Goldilocks, they're super special. And cold chain management is not a clinical role, it's everybody's role in your service. So ensure that your amazing admin staff are aware of how to plot their temperatures, how to download their data logger and, and where our phone number is to contact us. Ensure vaccines are put away as soon as they arrive. Ensure you have a battery operated midmax thermometer. Ensure your fridge is serviced every 12 months. And I know some of you are gonna be tempted to take vaccines out of their packaging so that you fit more in the fridge. All vaccines have to be stored in their original packaging. It becomes a cold chain breach because they're light effective. Don't take your vaccines out of their packaging. 
and complete your annual Strive for Five self audit. And honestly, give us a call. Thank you so much. Here's our website, make it your favourite. Don't find us on Bing, you can only find us on Google, HNE Health Immunisation. And the live polls are going to keep popping up. <laughs> oh, no questions. <laughs> Put any questions in the chitty chat. Sharon's on there answering them now. I'm now going to hand over to Rebecca and then we'll finish off with Patrick. So stay with us. Well, we know that Patrick's the main show. We know. <laughs> oh. Well done. Thank you. Ooh. I got it. I got it. <laughs> Five more minutes and you get Patty back, I promise. All right, so just to... I'm going to be the person answering the phone in the morning to all these form, these storms. So looking forward to hearing from you all. Um, so just a quick five minutes about the healthcare workers and mostly their students that are filling up your appointments at the moment. They've all started uni. They've received their occupational vaccination and screening package and they've come and made an appointment with you to, to get that all sorted out. This is a policy requirement for everyone that works for New South Wales Health, students, new recruits, volunteers, agency staff, cooks, cleaners, you get one of these badges, you need to get vaccinated. Um, they need, the requirements need to be met prior to commencement, or which means before you get offered your job or before the end of first year if you're a student. So the majority of these catch-up vaccines are done by you guys out there. They're done in general practice. Um, for all of our pharmacist immunizers that are online, you can, you're authorized to administer all of the vaccines that are recommended in the policy except for the varicella. That's just what your um, authority says. Um, and there's loads and loads of resources on the New South Wales Health Immunisation page. So that one's a different page to our page that Jody just promoted um, and the link's there and there's all that information that you can get. So I'm not going to speak a lot to each disease requirement today. Um, promoting Health Pathways again, Sandra is just an amazing resource collector. Shout out to Sandra if you're listening. Um, so to get really into the down and dirty for all the disease specifics, you can access the health pathways and all the recommendations are consistent with the Australian Immunisation Handbook as well. So if you get a student come in and they're really not sure what they need to do, but they know they need to have be up to date for measles, mumps, rubella, go to your chapter and you, you're going to know what to give. The most important thing for vaccinating one of your students or your healthcare workers is the documentation requirements. I think we're all very used to, you know, the high bar for, for having your vaccine documented now due to um, COVID-19 and needing to show evidence of COVID-19 vaccine in certain settings over the last couple of years. Healthcare workers have had that same level of evidence for a whole bunch of vaccines you know, for years and years and years. So you might get people come in with this red and white form, which is now a three page document with some very clear instru instructions for you. You can fill that out, but the level of documentation required on that is really high. We want dates, we want batch numbers, we want signatures, we want stamps. And if anything that's written on that form is not clear, that person's gonna be set back to you to, to fix it up because um, the bar's quite high. People are coming into hospital to get looked after. They're expecting to not catch diseases off the people looking after them. And this policy is all that's really standing in between that, that from happening in relation to vaccine preventable diseases. Your time is probably better spent making sure all these vaccines are on the AIR so that you can um, do it once. These people might be 18, who knows where that, that piece of paper is going to end up by the time they've moved house three times and are going for a job in five years. If you put their vaccine on the AIR, it's going to be there forever. They can download it as many times as they want. Some quick tips around the AIR and looking for evidence that 
The Australian Childhood Immunisation Register was introduced in 1996. So that means the majority of people under 27 are going to have their childhood records on what is now the AIR. It became the AIR in 2016. So um, vaccines that are given um, from that point, any vaccine might be on there, but it's only your childhood ones that for under your 27 year olds. Hep B is one that they're really looking for. It was universally funded on the childhood schedule from March 2000. So therefore, you're 23 and under, you should be able to find their evidence on the AIR. We did catch up for adolescents through the school program that Sharon's already talked about. Um, so you could direct people that are around 30-ish and younger to our website, which you've already seen, for instructions on how to um, request having their school vaccination record uploaded to the AIR. If documented evidence isn't available, then the recommendation is to commence vaccination, particularly for somebody that is waiting on getting a job you're far better off to stick a vaccine in their arm and have them able to be eligible for employment, to get out there, get working, get that going, than to stuff them around looking for bits here and there when it may or may not be found. Particularly, as I said, if they're over 30, those records are potentially in a retired GP's office and never, never accessible again. And just some real quick practice points around some of the diseases. Hepatitis B is what you're probably going to be dealing with most. Hopefully they're a young person, their records are already on the AIR. You can see that they've had a, a valid course. Any valid course that is in the immunisation handbook is acceptable. Pay close attention to your minimum intervals and I've just put the minimum interval for a three dose course up there. Because this information's been moved into a table in the back of the immunisation handbook and I've spent a good half a day locating that. So for anybody else out there that's looking for it, it is still in there, but that's what it is. Um, mostly, they'll have a valid course, it'll be on the AIR. What you're looking to do is check their surface antibodies, which is the measure of immunity. If that is not immune, a booster dose is recommended and further serology. If it's still not immune, two more doses with a one month interval and further serology. Then their employer will manage them as a Hep B non-responder if they're still not immune. And this information is in the immunisation handbook under the hepatitis B chapter, recommendations, serology following vaccination. It is a little bit hidden, don't expect you to remember all of this, but if you're looking around that area, you should be able to find it. DTPA is one of the vaccines that are re recommended, big and red, serology is never acceptable. There is no good test for any of those um, vaccine preventable diseases on serology. ADT is not accepted. It's really the pertussis component that um, is, is recommended for healthcare workers to, to prevent them from passing that on to vulnerable patients. If an ADT is inadvertently being given or given for another reason before they, they come up and say, I've just enrolled in nursing, I need this vaccine, you can give the DTPA at any interval and a, your DTPA must be within the last 10 years. So if they had a DTPA at school and they're wondering if they should, um, should bother us to look for that record. If it's been more than 10 years since they were in year seven, you're far better off just jabbing them. If it's been nine years since they were in year seven, you could consider jabbing them so that they're all, all sorted before they um, start their employment, maybe nine and a half. It's a really dark cupboard we've got to look for those records in. Um, practice point for MMR and varicella bundled together, protection should be assumed based on the number of documented doses received. This is because what we know is we give these people vaccines and the epidemiological data shows that those, the rates of disease have just completely dropped off. These vaccines work, they work really well. Serological testing is a bit of a backup. It's not the best marker of immunity and it's really just used as a backup when you had nothing else. If you've got two doses documented, we don't need to prove they're immune. 
we know they're immune. However, if somebody else has done serology and you've got that in front of you, what do you do? If we've got a non-immune serology after two doses, we give a booster. Non-immune serology after one dose, you give a second dose. Non-immune serology, no doses are documented. You need to give them two doses. And two doses are funded by New South Wales um, for people who born post-1966 and don't have evidence of two doses of vaccine. Similar principle for, for varicella, only one dose is funded in a childhood schedule. That is considered acceptable for a healthcare worker if it was given at the right age, but it is a chance to promote opportunistic vaccination by recommending a second dose if um, that person would like it. And that concludes our healthcare workers. And what's gonna pop up is, do you add vaccines given elsewhere to the air? And Patrick will be joining you now. Thank you, Rebecca. That was fantastic. So those questions are up on Slido for you. So do have a look at those when they pop up. And uh, participate and, and the um, feedback and, and the uh, answers are very helpful. Okay, fantastic. So very big thanks to Jody, Sharon and Rebecca for those wonderful presentations. Thanks for you guys at home for hanging in there um, on the homeward stretch now. Um, it was raining before here <laughs> very heavily, so I'm sure you, you're getting some squalls around your place. Uh, but we'll try to keep things calm um, and, and keep things ticking along. And one way, if you're looking for information, go to place is the Health Pathways. Lots of information there for all parts of general practice. So not just vaccination. We're talking about immunisation and vaccinations tonight. Um, but for all parts of um, general practice, there's lots of information on health pathways, no matter what you're looking for. And the pathways people do a really good job of consulting with experts um, and have each pathway is really well written. And it's written for people in this area to find information about referrals in this area. So. Uh, big hats off to uh, Sandra, Marika um, and Denise and the whole team at Pathways. They do a great job. So when you're looking for information, that's your place to go. And they're on our case about keeping things up to date. Um, and and that, that whole Health Pathways package is really, really good. So thoroughly recommend it to you in general practice. Um, the Australian Immunisation Register that Jody and Rebecca were just talking about. Now it's fantastic now if you've got your practice software up to date, you can send information to the AIR when you vaccinate a kitty, which we've always been able to do, but now the AIR can communicate back to your practice software so you can see if the kitties had vaccines elsewhere, you can see whether they're up to date or not. So that's absolutely fantastic. So if that's not happening at your practice, have a chat to your practice manager, get them to talk to your um, software vendor and make sure it's up to date so you get that web services thing happening because that's going to make an enormous difference for accurate recording. Um, and like Rebecca was saying, people need good accurate recording of their vaccinations these days. Uh, so uh, Rebecca's talked about the flu tracking data and really encourage you to get involved in flu tracking. Uh, so up the top there, um, you can see that uh, this is the last five years data from 2019 through to this year. And you can see that with respiratory illness, um, we, we've got more respiratory illness over the summer we just had than we have uh, during most of the pandemic, except halfway through 2022. So there's still lots of respiratory illness around. And even though um, it was the warmer weather, uh, we saw lots of respiratory illness. So. Uh, make sure you're giving your vaccines for respiratory illness, so influenza, COVID, and pneumococcal. Um, for um, the bottom graph there, you can see that kids under five have a lot more respiratory illness uh, than older people. So influenza vaccine is really important for kids under five. 
So uh, less so for COVID that we talked about for before, but influenza vaccines really strongly recommended for kids under five to keep the kids well and to stop that virus moving around the community. Um, meningococcal uh, disease, uh, this is poor young Charlotte um, who has no arms. Uh, now, when we give a vaccine, we often the kids will cry and it's not our favourite consultation. The kid comes in well, we give them the vaccine and they go out crying. Whereas most things, the kids come in upset, we fix them up and they go out better off and we feel good about that. Um, but would you rather give a vaccine or look after poor Charlotte without any arms? So give the vaccines, it's life saving, it's limb saving. And you can see there uh, down the bottom, how common is it? So uh, Charlotte's from the States, this, this is uh, an, an American site. Uh, but for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia, compared to other people in Australia, 2.4 times higher and 4.3 times higher for Aboriginal children less than five years of age and five times higher for Aboriginal children aged 5 to 14. And as Jody said, the free funding, a catch-up funding for Aboriginal kids expires at the end of this financial year. So if you've got Aboriginal kids that haven't had a Bex Zero under two years of age, make sure you catch them up, prevent this sort of outcome, and then that will be on the schedule ongoing uh, for Aboriginal children um, at uh, six weeks, four months, and 12 months of age. Uh, so that's a really important vaccine. And wonderful Professor David Durheim, our boss, uh, he's on um, the World Health Organization WIPS our committee for measles. And if he was here, he would um, tell us that measles is increasing with the pandemic. A lot of uh, countries have decreased their immunization rates. Measles is coming back. We want to really put a barrier to measles coming back into Australia. We really want to make sure kids have had that measles vaccine at 12 months of age. And measles kills kids. MSF, the first thing they do when they set up a refugee camp in, 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 in a country is make sure all the kids are vaccinated against measles because the first thing that will kill kids in a refugee camp is measles. So we don't want to see that in Australia, so we want to really be giving that vaccine. Uh, rural vaccines are really, really important. Q fever is a terrible disease, um, occupational disease in rural areas of Hunter, New England, and the northern part of Hunter, New England is probably the epicentre of Q, Q fever in, in Australia. Um, so who needs the vaccine? Anyone over 15 who's working on a property, lives on a property. Uh, you can see there that the risk is higher for men in the light blue and the risk is really middle aged. So if you haven't had Q fever disease and you haven't had Q fever vaccine and you're working on a property or you're working in a rural area, make sure you get vaccinated. Now Q fever is an unusual vaccine. Most vaccines you can just give again and again without any consequence. This vaccine, uh, you get a nasty um, a necrotic lesion if you've had the disease or the vaccine before. So this is very unusual for a vaccine. So you need to be tested. So a lot of, um, any GP can give this vaccine, uh, but some GPs tend to do it more regularly, run clinics, which is more cost effective for people paying for this vaccine. Um, so if you're not doing it regularly and you're looking after people in rural areas, um, then do recommend that those people go to a, a GP or a practice um, that give Q fever uh, vaccine regularly. And Jody and Kirsty and Peter Massey are leading a study looking at um, giving this vaccine to younger people, but at the moment it's only registered for people over 15, um, giving it to people between 10 and 14 who are obviously living on properties and um, uh, uh, working with the cattle, working with the sheep, uh, so they're at risk, uh, looking at giving them those, that vaccine. So that's great work um, um, by other people in, in the public health unit. Um, so, yeah, if you've got rural people, you need to be looking after them. Really, really important. Now, this is an unfunded vaccine. Can you imagine if um, we saw this epidemic curve of um, people in the city getting crook? Uh, we wouldn't have it as unfunded. So the uh, rural folk um, aren't being looked after well enough by the people looking after the funding of vaccines. I'll talk about sh uh, Shingrix, the shingles vaccine. Um, so on the left-hand side is a classic case of Chicken pox, and on the right-hand side is herpes zoster. Uh, so shingles or zoster are interchangeable terms. So we're talking about um, varicella zoster virus. Uh, so chicken pox epidemiology. So the chicken pox vaccine was introduced in 2005 in Australia, and we used to see nearly a quarter of a million cases of chicken pox, 1,500 hospitalizations, and nearly 10 deaths every year due to varicella. 
Now, since 2005, since we've been jabbing kids with chickenpox vaccine, um, kids um, up to school age have seen a nearly 70% decline of varicella hospitalisation. So this is what vaccines do. They keep kids out of hospital. Absolutely fantastic. And hospitalisation rates in, in other age groups has declined. Uh, but you'll know the pathophysiology of, the, of Zoster. So you get chicken pox when you're a kid and then you overcome it. Your immune system overcomes it. And then that virus will sit on a nerve ending, um, on a dermatome, and it'll sit late in there, kept in check by your immune system. Now, I'm sure it's a very useful audience out there and you wouldn't know, but as you get older, parts of your body don't seem to work as well as they used to. Your hair falls out, your knees get sore, your back gets sore, and lo and behold, your immune system's the same. It doesn't work the same when you're older as when you were younger. So your immune system falls away a bit and that virus sitting on the ganglion there says, oh, beauty, there's no immunity, I'm going to run out and make trouble. And that's why you get this classic pattern following a dermatome um, laterally from your spine with herpes zoster. And of course, you can get it uh, from facial nerves and you get terrible um, um, ophthalmitis. <laughs> um, absolutely terrible. So now this is preventable with vaccination. And this is really, really common. Um, so Jarvis Cocker in Pulp used to sing, I want to live like common people, I want to do whatever common people do. I want to get shingles with common people. So shingles is really, really common. Even Jarvis Cocker knows that. Um, so nearly a third of people will develop shingles in their lifetime um, after 50. And in Australia, around 120,000 new cases of Zoster every year. And what amazing data from Sanjay at the National Centre Approximately one in 1,000 of all GP visits are to do with shingles. So that's huge. So if we can vaccinate people over 50, we're going to decrease that drain on GP resources. So that's preventable um, uh, presentations to GPs, which is exactly what we want to do. We want to take the, give, vaccinate the community and take pressure off the health services so that health services can look after um, other, other things that aren't vaccine preventable. PHN, not the primary health network in this case, it's post-hepatic neuralgia. So one of the things we really want to protect with Zoster is that after Zoster's healed, you can get a persistent pain for over three months and it's described as a burning pain. Zoster sin herpati is when you get the pain without the rash. Um, so about one in five herpes zoster cases over 80 and one in 10 um, for people 50 to 50. Uh, nine. So that's terrible. So that's three months of pain. It's a long time to be in pain. So pre preventing Zoster, um, it's really, really worthwhile. Happily, there's a vaccine and a vaccine that's funded. Zostavax is funded. Um, so Zostavax, the efficacy there, you can see in the first column against shingles. In the second column, the efficacy against post-hepatic neuralgia. Now, it's funded in the second bottom uh, row there, 70 to 79. And you can see there 67% effectiveness against post-hepatic neuralgia in that age group. And that's why it's funded in that age group. So it's NIP funded. You can see in the comments, comments on the right-hand side there. Uh, so that's the current funded vaccine. It's a live vaccine. It's like the chickenpox vaccine, but it's about 14 times stronger. Um, you can see the um, upright dotted line there that since Sostavax has been funded, the, drain, uh, the um, prescriptions for antivirals um, has gone down. So this vaccine's working really well. So that's great. But there's a drawback. If your immunity's a bit low, this vaccine can occasionally, very rarely, replicate out of control and you can get an overwhelming varicella infection. Uh, so the paper on the left from the BMJ is about a case in um, the United Kingdom, fatal disseminated varicella zoster infection following Zostavax in an immun immunocompromised patient. Now, unfortunately, that has also happened in Australia. A poorly resourced GP working by themselves gave Zostavax to an immunocompromised person um, who, who also was a, a fatal. Uh, so you can see their advice from the TGA um, uh, uh, saying that you cannot give this vaccine to immunocompromised people. But happily, there's another vaccine available that doesn't have these problems, Shingrix. So this is newish. Um, and you would have seen some television advertisements about this recently, probably. Um, 
And, and, and hence, hence why I'm, I'm talking about it a little bit because it's in the public consciousness. So Shingrix, um, it's a really, really good vaccine and it doesn't have the problems with the immunocompromise. Uh, so you can give this vaccine to immunocompromised people and it's recommended to people over 50. So you can see Zostavax and Syngrix in comparison there. So Zostavax is just a single dose subcutaneously. Syngrix is two doses, um, but it's not funded. It's not funded. But if you're over 50 and you don't want shingles, it might be worth buying. So it's not cheap. Um, it's about the sort of $260 a dose uh, mark at a... At a um, it's a script from your GP or at a pharmacy. Um, so two doses, about two to six months apart. But if it's been more than six months, you can still have it. And that's recommended for people over 50 who are immunocompetent and people over 18 who are immunocompromised, but it's not funded. So Zostavax is funded at 70 on the national schedule. So Shingrix is a recompetent vaccine, which means that um, it, the DNA is taken from the virus. So the DNA makes those... Uh, proteins you can see on the outside of the virus there. We've got used to looking at those in terms of the spike protein with COVID, but this is the uh, varicella protein, and that's the thing that causes the disease. So in the varicella virus, the DNA code will make those proteins. So what happens with the recombinant process is that a little bit of the DNA is cut off with restriction enzymes, that enzyme is then, the piece of DNA is grown in a vector cell. You can see there in the Petri dish. Um, that vector cell will then produce the virus proteins and then they're harvested and they're used in the vaccine to stimulate the immune system. Now, hepatitis B vaccine is made this way and Gardasil. So this is a really safe technology. Um, it's really, really good. Uh, it works really, really well. It's very, very proven. So we've got used to looking at how vaccines work with mRNA, so the messenger RNA, with the um, Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. So this is an older technology where it's not the messenger, the recipe, it's actually a little piece of DNA in a vector making those proteins which are then harvested which stimulate the immune system. So that's the on the left hand side there, so the RZV, recombinant zoster vaccine. Um, the antigen, the recombinant process on the left, but the real magic of this vaccine is the adjuvant. So an adjuvant is something that's added into the vaccine that helps the immune system pick it up and then it works much better. So the dendritic cells pick it up and you make much better T cell immunity and B cell immunity because the adjuvant it picks, picks up that vaccine and you use a lot more of the vaccine. So the middle one there is a lipid and, and the uh, little green thing is the... Um, a little plant, and it's the uh, saponin plant from Chile, and that's what makes the um, the adjuvant, and that works really, really well. So the recombinant pro um, antigen on the left, the pink, and then the the lipid, and 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 the uh, QS21, which is the um, the name of the um, uh, the uh, um, a protein and the adjuvant, and they combine together, and it gives you really, really good. Um, Data. So this is, on the left-hand side, is the, um, uh, the adjuvanted vaccine, the different age groups. Um, so 50 in the dark, 60 to 69 in the middle, and then 70 plus in the lighter. And on the right-hand side is the antigen, but with saline, so without the adjuvant. And you can see there the huge bonus the adjuvant gives the, um, the lines on the left-hand side even in 70 plus compared to um, just the antigen and saline on the right. So the adjuvant makes a huge, huge difference. Now you recognise this guy in the tux? No, it's not me. It's David Bowie, yeah? And his son, Zoe Bowie. So when I was growing up, I thought that was the coolest name of all time. And the reason I bring that to your attention is because the wonderful studies on Zostavax are called the Zoe studies. Zoe 50 and Zoe 70. Yep, so that's how you remember. Zoe Bowie. Now, you'll remember this because it's Zoe. How can you forget? But poor Zoe didn't like to be called Zoe, so he went by his other Christian name, Duncan. So he's known as Duncan. I think that's very uncool, being called Duncan rather than Zoe, but apparently he prefers it. He's a Bowie, so he can do whatever he wants. So the New England Journal of Medicine. So this is work led by Professor Cunningham from Sydney. 
Uh, so the New England Journal of Medicine, you know it's our predominant um, medical journal um, produced in Armidale in the New England region of New South Wales. So those Zoe studies 50 and 70, they're the ones you go to if you want really good information on the efficacy of the Shingrix vaccine. And what did they find? So again, this is um, data from Professor Cunningham's group. So we're comparing the, um, uh, the vaccine there to the placebo, and you can see the vaccine efficacy in the 50 group is 91%, in the 70 plus group is 88%. And there were no cases of PHN uh, in the 50 to 69 group. So you can see there um, four cases and same with 70 plus. So, uh, so that's the combined data there. So actually no PHN in 50 plus. So this vaccine works really, really, really well. And the reason is the recombinant process, which is reliable, producing that um, antigen plus the adjuvant. Um, but you pay a high price. Because it works so well, it's very reactogenic, which means you get a lot of local reactions. That's what reactogenic means. So injection site reactions, 82% compared to 12% for a placebo. Systemic adverse reactions, fever, fatigue, gastrointestinal upsets, headache, myalgia, 60 60%, over twice a placebo. Um, so rates of local reaction is much more for Shingrix than for Zostavac. So Shingrix works really well, but you pay a high price, you're going to get lots of local reaction. So when you're talking to people, absolutely have this vaccine, but it's going to knock you around for a few days. Yeah, so it's not the vaccine you have the night before you run a marathon. Uh, so when you look at the dosing, uh, there wasn't a lot of difference between the first and the second dose. So what about people who had a terrible time the first dose? So only about a third of people who had a terrible time with dose one went on to have a terrible time after dose uh, two. So most people, six, uh, two thirds of people, even if dose one knocked them around, they're not too bad after dose two. So this is a really good vaccine, thoroughly recommend it, but it is expensive and it's not funded. Two doses, two to six months apart, widely available now at GPs and pharmacies. Um, the immunisation handbook is completely updated, the shingles uh, section, so your go-to place, apart from um, our website, is the immunisation handbook. Lots of um, questions there now answered, answered in detail. Uh, people over 50 who are immunocompetent, yes, they can absolutely have Shingrix. People over 18 who are immunocompromised or expected to be immunocompromised, yes, they can have Shingrix to protect against Zoster. Receiving Shingrix if previously vaccinated with Zostavax, yes, it gives better protection. It's not a bad idea, um, but you want to leave at least a 12-month period. Um, receiving Zostavax, if you've previously had Shingrix, well, there's probably no point because Shingrix works much better. Household contacts of people who are immunocompromised, yes, you can absolutely have Shingrix, and that's a good idea because then you're less likely to get Zoster and infect that immunocompromised household member. Um, people have had a previous episode of herpes zoster. Yes, about 5% of people have had zoster go on to get it again. Um, but again, not more than um, uh, leave a 12-month period. Um, and people who are vaccinated with varicella vaccine, yes, they can have Shingrix later on in life and you don't need to do testing. Um, but as I said, it's not funded, um, but GSK is the sponsor for the Shingrix vaccine. Uh, they're putting a case to the... Um, to the PBAC for funding for Shingrix. We'll have to wait and see what happened. This, is, this has happened before and the PBAC decided it wasn't um, uh, economically viable to fund it, uh, but we're waiting for a new um, uh, decision next month. So we'll have to wait and see. So it's just, Now, most vaccines are equivalent. Often you'll have different brands of vaccines in your fridge against the same disease and mostly they're equivalent. This is a case where they're not equivalent, where the Shingrix, the, inactivated vaccine actually works better than the live vaccine and it, it will last longer and um, but it does have um, more side effects. Uh, so usually the live vaccine will work better than the inactivated vaccine because the live vaccine, so measles vaccine, varicella vaccine, um, replicates to work so it looks like the natural disease. If it looks like the natural disease, it builds good immunity. This is an unusual case um, but the Shingrix in this case is a superior vaccine which is unusual, but it's worth thinking about for anyone over there, out there watching for yourself, if you're over 50, in case there's anyone in that age group. Who would have thought? Adverse events following immunisation. 
giving the vaccine properly is absolutely critical. Um, so we get, more often than I'd like, photos sent in to us of people who think the vaccines haven't been given correctly uh, with local providers. So you can see this little kitty, uh, it's got a nasty local reaction and this vaccine given too low. So the last nasty reaction is, is sort of from mid arm down to the elbow. Um, the deltoid up on the left hand side of the picture is completely unaffected because the vaccine wasn't put in the deltoid. Uh, this young child um, vaccinated recently in our area, the picture on the left, the two vaccines are given a little bit low. Again, the deltoid's superior to that. And on the right, um, the vaccine's probably given a little bit high, probably just at the top part of the deltoid. Um, so again, making sure you get really good practice. So people are bringing their children into you to be vaccinated. You've got to do it right. You've got to do it properly. And you want to do it with all your medical and nursing nows. So you're talking to the kids, you're keeping them calm, you're using all those skills in your clinical repertoire so that that child will be as still as possible and you can hold that limb still and give the vaccine, in this case, in the deltoid. Now, if you do give it too high, like the one on the uh, right-hand side there, um, you've got uh, the bursa um, at the top of the, um, uh, the, top of the uh, superior to the deltoid. It's a little bit deep, but it's a fluid-filled sac, and unsurprisingly, fluid-filled sacs don't like to be stuck with a needle or have um, fluid injected around them. So I've tried to find you a typical patient um, with a typical deltoid. Um, I was just going to roll up my sleeve, but instead we'll go to a Hemsworth. <laughs> Any excuse to put a Hemsworth up in front of people is good. Uh, so there's a very typical patient of yours and there's a lovely deltoid there. So that's where you stick the needle into the deltoid, not superior, not inferior. Um, so getting your technique right is really, really important. You'll see less adverse events if you get your technique right. If you're not sure what you're doing, have a look at the immunisation handbook um, before you give the vaccines. But working with the kids, getting the parents to hold them still, using all that clinical acumen, um, that's the real skill of an immuniser. Yeah, that's the real skill. It's all those soft skills that we use in nursing and medicine that are really, really critical. It's having a calm environment, um, speaking uh, calmly and nicely. So adverse events is absolutely critical. Um, so sometimes with an older person, um, it's sometimes difficult to distinguish what's a seizure and what's a syncope. It would be extremely unusual to have a seizure after a vaccine. It's not that unusual to have a syncope. So features that are not helpful in distinguishing are twitching and jerking, incontinence, pallor, a little bite at the tip of the tongue or fatigue after the event. You'll see those with either. Um, but more helpful features, features are con uh, confusion after the event lasting over two minutes, a deeply bitten lateral border of the tongue, a tonic clonic movement lasting over a minute or deep cyanosis. So if someone um, immediately collapses after a vaccine and twitches a little bit, it's much likely, more likely to be a vasovagal event than a seizure activity. Now the thing we all worry about is anaphylaxis. Now anaphylaxis is an unusual um, response to a vaccine, about one in a million. Um, so it's likely you'll go through your whole immunisation career and not see any anaphylaxis. Um, but you do get clinical signs of anaphylaxis. So typically it's a loss of consciousness, hive type swelling, swelling of the tongue and swelling around the throat. So you'll get a stridor sort of thing. You can see these two young boys on the right hand side have got angioedema around the eyes and around, around, the, around the mouth. So the signs of anaphylaxis, so on the left hand side we've got a cascade, uh, so you've got histamine, tumor necrosing factor, other cytokines, and they're leaking out of mast cells. So where do you have mast cells? You've got mast cells in your skin, mast cells in your gut. So you've got all this histamine and other um, enzymes leaking out of your mast cells. So you're going to get capillary breakdown, so you get the redness in your skin, and you get all this histamine leaking into your gut. Uh, so that may give, give you the GIT symptoms. So if someone feels a bit uh, nauseous after a vaccine, um, it's good to watch them for a little bit longer than you, than you would otherwise. So you get this cascade um, causing capillary leakage, um, edema, bronchospasm, uh, and then your BP drops. But when you give the adrenaline, it reverses all of these things. 
So you get an increase in cardiac contraction, increase in BP, um, bronchodilation, relieves the respiratory um, uh, stride or, uh, and then uh, uh, the person will immediately pick up. Obviously they've got to go to ED for um, observation. So you never ever give a vaccine in any circumstance unless you've got adrenaline at hand. But this is really, really unusual. You need to be prepared to it. You need to be able to diagnose it. You need to be able to give the adrenaline if you think this is happening. But it is really, really unusual. Now, um, Sarah Barnes, an immunologist in Victoria, led some work recently. So looked at 10 people that had COVID vaccine. Uh, and this is published in the Journal of Allergy. Um, 10 people that had had COVID vaccine, that had had anaphylaxis, that re received adrenaline. Uh, she challenged them again with a second dose of the same vaccine. Um, a lot of them had the same uh, features, but she did um, uh, look down at their vocal cords at the, that time and found that they had no angioedema there. So people can look like they're having anaphylaxis, but they're actually not, which, which is the point of her work. So what she says there is that the Brighton Collaboration, which is the go-to place for um, adverse event um, uh, definitions, um, and, and the features of anaphylaxis include respiratory Ill, uh, distress, tachypnea, hoarse voice, stridor, and throat closure. And those things are very similar to what she calls vocal cord dysfunction that she proved um, by having a look at the vocal cords after a challenge with the second vaccine. So she says that you need to be aware that the two sets of symptoms look similar. So because someone's got um, throat constriction and their voice is a, a, a bit challenged, doesn't mean that they're having an anaphylaxis. Now, if I get too excited and I have a cardiac arrest here and I collapse on the floor, the other people in the room have got to act fairly quickly um, to save my life. But in an anaphylaxis situation, you've got that cascade that I demonstrated in the previous slide. You've got minutes to react. It's not instant. You don't just see someone's got a little bit red around the lips and you reach for the adrenaline. Prepare the adrenaline, get it ready, but you can afford to watch them and observe what's happening. And obviously you give the adrenaline, don't withhold the adrenaline if you think you, they um, need it, but you can watch them for a little while and just see what's happening. Obviously it depends where you are. If you're giving a vaccine in a, in a hospital and there's um, hundreds of anaesthetists down the corridor, you can afford to wait a bit longer than if you're in a, um, a small country town without a doctor around. Um, so there's no, no, um, uh, no advice to withhold adrenaline, but there is advice to watch someone. And if you do give adrenaline, make sure you get them assessed by an immunologist so that their um, pathway to having future vaccines is open. Um, now, the World Health Organization, just before the pandemic, put out a fantastic publication and it's looking at stress-related responses. Now, at the big immunisation um, COVID clinic at Belmont, um, fantastic setup. Um, it was run all by nurses. Um, but for some people that had, uh, looked like they had some sort of allergic response to the first dose, uh, uh, Dr. Boyle, the immunologist, would come down and he would give the second dose and he would do it very calmly and talk people through it. And it was absolutely phenomenal that with that calm approach, a lot of people didn't get an anaphylactic type picture with the second dose because a lot of it is the, um, the vocal cord uh, disruption that we talked about in, in, with that paper from Sarah Barnes. So really calm approach. So the way you give vaccinations, the way you approach vaccinations will make a big, big difference to the adverse events that you get. Uh, so a vasovagal reaction, you get this initial stress response. So if you can stop that initial stress response through really good care, um, you can really prevent some of these um, reactions. Um, so you get the sympathetic involvement, uh, increased heart pressure and blood pressure, and then you get an overcompensation of a parasympathetic response and the blood pressure will drop, the heart rate will drop, and then you get the vasovagal because of that parasympathetic compensation. So it started with an initial stress response. So if you have a very calm approach to vaccination and the person feels good, they're going to have less chance of having a stress response and less chance of having an adverse event. So the way you give the vaccine is absolutely critical. A calm private space is really important. 
So in this World Health Organization publication, which was led by Professor Mike Gold from South Australia, absolutely giant in the adverse event field, um, you can see it's this biosocial um, um, design where the World Health Organization are looking at. So across the top there, you've got pre-existing conditions and conditions occurring du during the vaccination will add. And what they've done, they've broken it down to physiological, psychological and social. So if someone's all uptight about social media before they come to the, get the vaccine, then that social one at the bottom, they're going to be much more likely to have a stress response. Um, their ability to understand and reason, obviously you can't do that with children, but you can with older people with a psychological uh, one in the middle. And the physiological, so um, a person, an adolescent, is more likely to have a vasovagal response. Um, and someone with a lower body weight is more likely to have a vasovagal response. So if you can control the way you're giving the vaccine and think about it as psychological, physiological and social, then you can work out where to intervene, which is what this WHO um, paper talks about. There's some great case studies in there. I won't go through them, but, but what it's talking about, you can see there one, two, three down the bottom, before immunisation, during immunisation and after immunisation. Do what you can to intervene to keep the person calm and to, to have a really good medical interaction with someone. So it's not something you're doing um, as you fly through a room, you jab someone. This is really important um, part of primary care, and the better you do it, um, it'll make a big difference. Um, there's good evidence. Uh, there's a, um, a paper that Robert Boy um, had a hand in, and it's saying that if someone exercises before a vaccine, they're much less likely to have um, a bad outcome and to feel pain than if they're all tensed up sitting in the corner waiting nervously before um, you get the needle out. So the approach is really, really important. So with the vasovagal, um, the syncope, um, one re, um, way of helping prevent is this muscle tension thing. So you, on the right-hand side, again, this is from the WHO paper. Uh, so you get someone to tense their muscles and relax, tense their muscles and relax, and they're much less likely you can control that parasympathetic response and much less likely to have a vasovagal response afterwards. And again, from the, from the WHO um, um, paper, um, so you're looking at the, the sections there, um, before vaccination, during the vaccination and after the vaccination, and then the different um, things that we've been talking about. So in yellow, the biological, in blue, the psychological, and in green, the social. So if you think about young people, particularly what that they read on the internet, or if some teacher's geeing them up and teasing them, or their parents are teasing them, they're much more likely to have a reaction because of that stress response than if it's calm and people have got good information. So the way you approach immunisation will have a big impact on the adverse events afterwards. Um, so the uh, reporting adverse events is really important, and everything about AFIs and everything about anything you want to know about general practice, of course, is on the health pathway. Now, we must report adverse events. If we want people to believe our data, then we must be reporting adverse events. And reporting of adverse events is really, really low. We find out lots of people that have had myocarditis after a mRNA vaccine, and we don't know about it because GPs and nurses are not reporting these things. So we're going to make the process easier. So at the moment, you fill out um, a PDF form and fax it into us anywhere in the country except from today in Hunter, New England, you can now do it online. And big thanks to Rebecca, who built this system. Um, so now there will be a link on our website. Uh, you'll be able to click on that link and report online your adverse events. So no more mucking around with printing off PDFs and faxing it in. Um, so if you're a busy clinician, um, you can put in the clinical details and ask your clerical um, admin staff to help by putting in the, the other details. Um, and Rebecca's built in even a quick reporting. So if you've only got a short period of time, you can do a quick reporting. Uh, so this work is Rebecca's and, and I commend her for it. And hopefully, if any adverse events, then report them to us. Yep. So if it's something in the um, product information that we know about from the pre-licensure trial, so a sore arm, a bit of fatigue, we probably don't need to have that reported as an adverse event because we know about it from the pre-licensure trials. But anything else, please let us know. It's really, really important. Now, before the pandemic, the World Health Organization in 2019 said that vaccine hesitancy was one of the 10 
global threats to health. And we really, really saw that during the pandemic. And you think about that headline I put up from Texas at the beginning of the session. 9,000 people had died um, um, and only 43, um, all but 43 were unvaccinated because they were scared of having the vaccine, um, unfortunately, because now they're dead. Um, but there's lots of information about, a lot of misinformation about the vaccine. And there's a famous case recently, um, uh, the uh, federal, the previous former federal member, Dr. Karen Phelps, her partner, um, talked about having neurological symptoms after the vaccine. So this is a really tricky space. But again, if this is your patient, then you should be reporting it as an adverse event because we need to find out about this. Now, some people have had adverse events to immunisation. They blame the vaccine because they haven't been investigated. We really don't know whether it was the vaccine or not. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but because it wasn't investigated, we don't know. So we really must investigate all these. Uh, so the whole system needs to be transparent. Um, and if, if lots of things happen to people, and now we're vaccinating the whole community with COVID vaccines, so everyone in Australia, or about 90% of people in Australia the last few years have had a vaccine, then they've had other health complaints, so they link the two together because the vaccine happened and then the other health complaint happened. But does, that doesn't mean that the two are causal, it just means that they followed each other. Um, so Australia has a really good system of looking after people. So it's really important. And the thing a lot of these people say is that no one listened to me. So we might not be able to fix the problem, but we can listen to people. So it's really important if someone's come off second best or they think they've come off second best after a vaccine, that you report it to us. We can investigate it. Um, and a big thanks to um, Dr. Michael Boyle and Dr. Rani Bhatia from immunologists uh, in the Hunter area who helped us, who help us investigate cases. Then we can really look after these people and work out whether they can have further vaccines or whether they need other help. But we can at least investigate and we can at least listen and look after people because we don't want people to feel sidelined that they haven't been listened to. Um, so in Australia, we've got a, a very good adverse event system that includes these six things. So there's a great um, uh, comment piece um, from um, uh, Christine and Alan and Chris Blythe um, on the NC's website and Julie Leesk on the MC's website um, headed up how common are uh, severe side effects from COVID and how are they detected and it starts with the, um, uh, the partner of Dr Karen Phelps as a case study and they go through and they, they document that uh, what we do is we ask clinicians to report and Rebecca's just made that easier by being able to report online. We use active surveillance like Ausvac Safety that I help set up are monitoring conditions that could um, theoretically be a, a risk. So we monitor other conditions like GBS and, and track it back to vaccination. We get information from other countries to see what's happening globally because um, of all the vaccines, like 13 billion COVID vaccines have been given in the last few years. So we've got really good data from around the world. Um, we look at large studies using electronic databases and that's especially so in Europe and the United States. And we use a national system of GPs um, and, and experts to look at cases. And that's what I was talking about with case investigation. So if we're going to give vaccines, we must take AFI seriously. We really want to find out what the data is and then we can give people really good information. Then they can make up their own minds whether they have a vaccine or not. So in the first part of my talk, I talked about those decision aids on the NCS website for five to 15 and 16 plus, whether you're going to have a COVID vaccine or not. Now we can only give really good information if you guys are reporting to us when, when something goes pear-shaped after a vaccine or someone thinks something's gone pear-shaped after a vaccine. Doesn't mean they're related. Uh, so Vax Tracker, um, so this is from our website. I encourage you to go have a look and have a look at the in, in the news section. Um, so this is just a promotional website, um, but have a look because I'm promoting myself. <laughs> um, there's some wonderful resources for um, talking to people about vaccines. So Professor Julie Leesk is an international expert and she works with other people. Um, and there's a loose collaboration called COSI, um, looking at the social science of vaccination. And they've got a specific um, subgroup called SKY, sharing knowledge about immunisation. And this includes a lot of giants in the field, um, uh, Associate Professor Margie Denshin, Julie Leesk, 
um, and, and others. Um, so sharing knowledge about vaccination. Now if you go to the NCS website, you can find the Sky website and there's lots of really good information there. So I draw your attention to these ones. So talking to um, uh, First Nations people about influenza vaccine. So there's some great graphics. So um, First Nations people, like Rebecca said, are much more affected in Australia by influenza than other people. So really, really want to promote the vaccine, but there's a lot of nervousness about the vaccine um, in Aboriginal communities because they've been um, told a lot of uh, misinformation for the last 250 years. Uh, so understandably, they they want good information before they go ahead and have the vaccine. So there's really good information there. And there's these wonderful things about talking about flu vaccination and it just steps you through. So it's really, really worth having a look at the detail. So building rapport, again, the way we go about it. So it's not just about finding a deltoid and jabbing the needle in. It's the way you go about it will make a big difference to the adverse events and, and to that person's acceptance and coming back for more, more vaccines in the future. Um, ask questions. Think about families. First Nations people, family is really important. So yes, you might be vaccinating the grandmother, but what about the grandkids? Um, strong recommendation to vaccinate is important. So you need to be confident of the vaccines that you're giving and know about them. Um, and opportunistic vaccination. So if someone's come in to get their blood pressure checked or other health things, you have a look and say, oh, you're pneumococcal, you need a pneumococcal vaccine. Uh, so there's great um, things you can um, work through to uh, strengthen the conversations that you're having with people about vaccines. Um, so Research Australia in December 2022 um, had their awards um, and Ausvac Safety, we won the Data Innovation Award. Um, and I was down there for that, um, so very proud about that. Um, I've never worn a tux before, so I'll put my photo up there. Um, but um, ARIA, the Australian Regional Immunisation Alliance on Vaccination, um, uh, they um, great organisation uh, and they've recently, um, I'm going to go with them to the Solomon Islands for the next 12 months uh, working in vaccination. Um, so I'll be missing for the next 12 months after next week. Uh, so Jody will be the immunisation coordinator. So I really commend my team to you to, um, uh, to go to. So um, we really want to use the website that Jody promoted earlier. So Google H&E Immunisation. There's heaps of information in there on um, follow-ups, catch-ups. Um, cold chain reporting, often you don't need to pick up the phone and talk to us. Go to the website first because you might find the information there. If you can't find it, then please give us a ring. Um, but with the decreased resources we've got coming up, I really increase, encourage you to go to the website first um, before picking up the phone. Um, and the wonderful um, link that Rebecca's built, um, that will be um, there as well. And here's the team. Uh, so we've got a big team at the moment, but it'll be shrinking soon. Uh, so our ability to help you will shrink as well. So I really appreciate if you went to the website first to look for information, Google H&E Immunisation to, to, to look for cold chain catch-up resources. Uh, so that's the end of the formal presentations. And I think we'll have a go at questions. Todd, do you think we can organise that? Yep. So we're going to bring Sharon, Rebecca and Jody back up. And these are your go-to people for immunisation um, information while I'll be away for the next 12 months. Fantastic. Here come the A-team. Jenny, not joining us. So how are we running this? I don't know. How would you like to run it, Patty? It says that Jody is going to ask the oh, questions. Oh, Jody, you're going to ask some questions? No, no, Sharon's oh, got them all, okay. Patrick. Okay. All right. Oh, you should be sitting in the middle, Patrick. Oh, that's okay. Okay. So um, we had three questions around the same topic. Uh, a GP, it's all about DTPA, pregnant women, five-year boosters. Yeah. So different people recommending that we actually have to have it at five years. Yes. Um, instead of the 10 years, yep. uh, for all different reasons. So what is your take on that? Yeah, so this is, this is an interesting one. Um, so this recommendation came in prior 
to the recommendation of giving pregnant women the pertussis vaccine during pregnancy. So the giving the vaccine during pregnancy, that will build antibodies in the mum. Those antibodies will go sky high, enough to go through the placenta. So baby will be born with ready-made antibodies from mum if we vaccinate mum during the pregnancy. Now, before that recommendation, the only tool we had in our kit bag was vaccinating the people around the baby. So some of us that have been in this game for a little while are obsessed with vaccinating the people around the baby because that's all we had available. Mm. These days, vaccinating the mum does most of the heavy lifting. Now, if you vaccinate the people around the baby and they're not getting pertussis, obviously that's going to help protect the baby, but it's not as critical as it was mm. before we introduced that vaccine in pregnancy. So the main game is not vaccinating people around the baby, it's making sure mum has the vaccine during the pregnancy. But if you, it is a good idea to vaccinate the people around the baby, uh, but the handbook recommendation is 10 years. Uh, Rebecca's quite good on this. So the peak um, activity for that vaccine will start to wane at seven or eight years. So, so um, some people have taken that to mean, well, let's vaccinate every five years. If you're around a baby and you haven't had a booster for five years, Let's give you another one to help protect the baby. But if mum's had that vaccine, then the handbook recommendation's 10 years. So it's probably worth sticking with the handbook recommendation. Of course, like any recommendations, you can do your own thing. So if someone's, um, like if, if um, a grandmother's going to move into the house and be the sole carer of a baby, um, um, and mum and dad have got to go back to work, um, and grandmother hasn't had a vaccine for, say, eight years, you might want to stretch it and, and, and give her another one, and that's reasonable. But the standard answer is 10 years. The right answer in most cases will be 10 years. 10 years is the answer we should be giving. If you think circumstances, mm. you can decrease risk a lot. Because of the circumstances, then you can break the rules and use five years. But five years is the exceptional recommendation, not the usual recommendation. Um, but for most visitors who are just coming to see the baby, you know, pop around the house once a week, um, 10 years, 10 years, 10 years, 10 years is the recommendation. So, Rebecca, you're a bit of an expert on boostrix from your occupational stuff. Did you have anything to add to that? No, nothing to add to that. That's vaccinating mum's amazing. Yes, vaccinating mm. mum. So, yeah, vaccination in pregnancy is the best way to protect the baby, and that's where we should be concentrating our resources. And also, that's a funded vaccine, mm. whereas vaccinating people around the baby is, is, is unfunded. Yeah. Number four. So, are individual patients still able to report their adverse reactions they may have experienced from their COVID vaccine, maybe in 2021, something like that? Everybody's listened to your presentation, they're talking to their patients and they say, Doc, I had this terrible thing happen two years ago. Can they still report it? Yeah, so um, we really want the health professionals to report it because we're going to get much better medical information if doctors and nurses and pharmacists are reporting adverse event using the wonderful thing that you've built. <laughs> they just click on the link and fill in the form online. Much, much easier. Decrease the barriers to providers reporting. We'll get much better reports. But yes, people who've had a vaccine um, can report at the TGA website. They can put it on there themselves. Um, so Rebecca sort of wears our adverse event hat um, in, in our team. Um, did you want to add to that, Rebecca? Um, the only thing I would add is something I read today. So definitely report, definitely want healthcare workers to report because those reports are so much richer than, and allow us to do our in investigations are much better. Um, if your patient is reporting a potentially compensatable position, uh, mm. condition to you, mm. that scheme closes next year. I didn't realise that till today oh. when we were preparing this presentation. So that's just really important mm. as well to... I guess, let them know about that. It's unlikely because those conditions were really quite serious conditions that involved hospitalisation. But if, if that has occurred and you feel like that opportunity may have been missed, there is a window for that. So that would be things like the, the clots that people experience following the AstraZeneca vaccine or myocarditis following a, an mRNA vaccine. Our known adverse events that we, are, we know have caused people to wind up in hospital closes next year. So that might be something that's worth helping your patient complete that paperwork if they're reporting th 
those kind of adverse events to you. Yeah, perfect. Uh, we're still getting questions too about people with um, elderly people with the one dose of the Prevnar 13. So they've had their Numivax. Should they still have their Prevnar 13? Oh, yeah. So this is mm. the recommendation for adults at mm. 70 to have a Prevnar. In the past, it was to have a Numivax at 65. Yes. Yeah, so if you are had a Numivax at 65 and you're now turning 70, yes, have the Prevnar. Um, if you haven't had the Numivax and you're turning 65, you don't need it. Just have the Prevnar at 70. So you see, this is, um, they're throwing the, the questions to me, but 99% of the questions five days a week all go to these guys. These guys are actually better at answering the questions than I am. Did, and I didn't actually talk about um, um, pneumococcal vaccination tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so the recommendations to give um, one dose at 70. Um, do, do you two want to add to that? Just that it's funded from 70 and older? Mm -hmm. Yep. 50 yeah, 50 for oh, Aboriginal yeah. and Torres Strait Islanders. Yep. Yeah. So Numavax yeah. at 50 for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Not really a vaccine question, but we, you're an oracle of all things COVID. Are th is there any forecast on removing masks from the hospital setting? We're socialising out there in the community. We're going down to the pub, but when we come to work, we put a mask on. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> is, is that a waste of our, our health dollars, buying those masks, or is that a good strategy to protect yourself and your patients from COVID? Yeah, it is a good strategy. Um, so I'd love to sit here and say that the COVID vaccine is absolutely 100% perfect, and if you have a COVID vaccine, you'll never pass the virus on to someone else. But that's not the case. Um, so even though you're vaccinated, you can pass, and you don't have any symptoms, it is possible to pass the virus on. So we're going to get much less transmission of virus if the healthcare worker wears a mask. Um, so the healthcare worker wants to protect themselves so they can keep coming to work and not have time off with COVID. And obviously a lot of the patients are vulnerable, older, with other conditions, and, and you'll protect them a lot with a mask. So if the vaccines were perfect, we wouldn't need to wear a mask. The vaccines are not perfect. So yes, in a healthcare setting, in general practice and in hospitals, we all need to be wearing masks to protect ourselves or we'll have no healthcare workforce. Mm -hmm and to protect the patients. So there's a question here as well. Um, something that we see quite often is children who have had um, a documented three course dose of hep B. Yes. Um, and sometimes it's their adult, uh, the, the school ones where they had two doses. Yeah. But they're coming through later and when they test them serology later, it's um, inadequate. Yes. So the question here was a recommendation. Should we be actually recommending a booster later? Or what are we doing? Why are they showing up as? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, in COVID, we've got quite used to what we call hybrid immunity. So we get vaccinated and that gives us a baseline immunity. And then when we go to the supermarket and, and various places at work, we bump into the virus and that bumps up our immunity all the time. So we're constantly challenged with the virus. Our immune system's constantly working and we're building up antibodies and T cells to COVID. And we're getting better and better protection from the vaccination and from exposure to the virus. That's a hybrid immunity. Um, and nearly everyone in Australia has been exposed to COVID now. So we've all, most people are vaccinated, most people have been exposed. So we've all got a hybrid immunity. Now, hepatitis B, the exposure to hepatitis B is very, very different. <laughs> so most people, unless um, you're a healthcare worker and extremely clumsy with um, needle stick injuries, you're not constantly challenged by hepatitis B virus. So you'll get the vaccine either as an infant or you've had it at high school and then you've built up antibodies, but you're not constantly challenged, which means those antibodies will fall away. Yep. But if you are challenged in the future because you have an exposure to hepatitis B from some um, reason, then likely is that those memory cells are still there. We can't find the memory cells. When we do a serology test, we can find antibodies, but we can't look at memory cells. So we can't see if someone is going to make hepatitis B antibodies or not. So because you're not challenged all the time, you don't have circulating antibodies all the time, so you do a blood test, you don't see any immunity. Now you don't know whether that person is a non-responder, they're unable to make antibodies, or whether they've had the vaccine but haven't been challenged so they have no circulating antibodies. You can't tell. So um, in that case, if someone's a healthcare worker, and this is Rebecca's area, so I'll get her to take over, 
we would, um, what, what do we do in that case if someone's a healthcare worker? So they um, have had, say, adolescent hepatitis B, mm -hmm. they come in and they're a, a, a university student and they, they before their placement, um, what's the story there? So if you, I think the thing I'd want to add in between that is that on a population level, we give all babies back hepatitis B mm. because if they're exposed as little babies, they're at the highest risk of the most terrible outcome for hepatitis B. Good point. So from a population level and from an epidemiological level, what we're seeing with hepatitis B getting driven down in the community, we know the vaccine's working. We don't need to test the population to prove those antibodies because we know that we've got a good chance of potentially getting close to eliminating hepatitis B in Australia. When we employ somebody, your employer is liable for bad things that happen to you at work. When you work in healthcare, you're in one of the highest risks for getting exposed to blood and needles at the same time that somebody else's blood going inside your body. So what the employer is saying is, I want to prove that you're immune to hepatitis B before I go and let you get stuck, stuck with bloody needles. So that's why New South Wales Health and other private health organisations have it as their workplace policy to say, we want to prove that hepatitis B immunity for you so that I can worry less about workers' compensation and terrible things happening to you as a healthcare worker if you go and get stabbed with a dirty needle. So they go and test your blood. It's been 18 years since you last had a vaccine, like Patty said. No antibodies, but you've got memory cells. So that fourth dose that I spoke about, it's not about giving you more hepatitis B immunity. It's about challenging your body to see if we can ask it to make antibodies that then we can check for on your blood. The additional doses, so the up to three more, is about kind of giving you another course, but we do them a bit closer together. Um, so then you will have had potentially up to six doses in total, and that's around giving your body as much opportunity as possible to have a chance to, to show those antibodies before we go and manage you as a hepatitis B non-responder. And the reason, again, the employer wants to go through as many rungs as possible is if you are stuck with a dirty needle at work, which are hopefully people online probably have dealt with and know how stressful it is, but you're going up to ED, we're moving into communicable disease management, we're considering giving you hepatitis B immunoglobulin to reduce your risk of exposure, and you've got months and months and months of follow-up testing. So we want to manage it now, we want to do it because we want you to be safe at work. Nobody wants to get a terrible work cover came from catching hepatitis B at work. And we do know before hepatitis B vaccines, healthcare workers caught hepatitis B and didn't even know how they were exposed. Like they mm. caught it from <clears throat> clean and dirty wounds and didn't know they had to cut, things like that. Mm. So it is a high risk profession. And the reason you're getting tested really has nothing to do with the NIP <laughs> program and nothing to do with whether or not the NIP program is working mm. on a population level. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, so before we had hepatitis B vaccination at all, a lot of hepatitis B transmission would happen in kindergartens and stuff. So um, hepatitis B, uh, you don't need just like a dirty needle. Um, you know, kids are sort of into each other and, and stuff, and that was enough to pass it on. Um, but with vaccinating the population, we don't see that sort of transmission anymore. Yeah. There was just one other question about um, a very large practice can still only get five doses of Zostavax, but I think Jodie had some breaking news about that. Oh, Jodie's the font of all wisdom. She is, indeed. Bring her up in front of the camera. Hi there. Sorry, I'm not mic'd, so oh. I'll sure. hand that over. This is from Casey. From oh. Casey? Yep. So New South Wales Health have advised that Zostavax forecasts have been brought forward in preparation for flu season. Oh. Stock has now been received and restrictions have recently been increased. So there you go. So that's the funded Zostavax at 70, but you can protect people from 50 up if they purchase, for people who um, are wealthy enough to purchase two doses of Shingrix. That's right. And I did, um, somebody informed me on the chat that they recently gave a Shingrix and it was $291 a dose. Oh, that's a lot of money. So yeah, so if you've got a, your two doses, so you need six hundred odd dollars spare. Um, so if you can't pay next month's rent, it's probably not a good idea. 
um, if, you, if you've got $600 spare um, and you later on had three months of post-hepatic neuralgia, you'd probably think $600 was well spent. Mm. Yep. There were lots of questions, but they were the main <laughs> ones that we thought would um, yep, be right. good for everybody. Lots of so, Close, yes. So thank you very much for uh, watching and watching right through. And there's Todd's surprise at the end. Um, and thank you to Todd for doing the sound. Thank you to the PHN. Um, and thank you for asking questions and, and, mm. and, and uh, seeing this through for the whole two hours. And thank you to Rebecca, Sharon and Jody. And these guys are going to be running the immunisation unit and looking after you um, perfectly well over the next 12 months. Thank you, everyone. And I'm sure you'll join us in saying that we'll all miss Patty. <laughs> Oh, it's a surprise. There we go. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us. I know that it cuts into all of your at-home time, personal time, if it's a bad day, extra work time. Um, <laughs> huge shout-out to Patty and the team, Sharon, Beck and Jody. Thank you so much. I know that you guys have your own roles and everything, and this is a huge extra that you do for, for the good of the community. So thank you a lot. Um, the evaluation is up on Slido. If you need a certificate for this, you need to fill out the evaluation. Um, but thanks again. Enjoy your night. Stay safe.